It may come as a shock to a lot of you, but over my 30 years as a pastor, I've noticed that uh, regardless of where I go, there is conflict in the church. Have you ever noticed that? Ever had conflict in a church that you've been at? Now, I've been here 15 years, and I will have to say very thankfully that we haven't had a lot of controversy, a lot of conflict here among our members, but I want to talk about it today because wherever people are gathered in a marriage, if there are two, in a family, whether there are three or four or five, uh, in a small group, 10 or 12, in a church, wherever people are gathered, there's going to be conflict because people are people no matter where they are, who they are, and we all have our own opinions. And because we have our own opinions from time to time, there will be conflict. So as we look at our text for today, we need to set the scene. Galatia, province of Asia, about 10 to 20 years removed from when Jesus has ascended into heaven. Now, you would think in the early church, when it is that brand new, that the people of God, whose sole mission is to tell the world about the love of Jesus and prepare them for his return, that there wouldn't be any conflict because they're so focused on the most important thing, but not the case. There is this group, we'll call them the Judaizers, because they have Jewish roots. And then there are the others. They are the Gentiles, the non-Jews. They are the, the newer ones to the faith. In the old days, in the temple in Jerusalem, there was a wall, imagine, a wall here. Does anybody remember the days you have to go way back in the Lutheran church when the men sat on one side and the women sat on the other? Did you come from a church like that? There was a wall and it would keep the Gentiles in the back. They were in the outer court. They could not come into the inner sanctuary and be close to the altar. There was another court separating the women. They could also not come closer. And there were signs everywhere in Latin and in Greek. It would be the English of our day saying only come closer at the risk of death. So do you think we ought to do that today for all of our guests and visitors? Have a sign out front, say you can't come any closer because we've got to put you to death. You know, what do you think? Good idea? Make us warm and friendly and fuzzy all over? Well, think of this. The group, the Judaizers, not only did they want to keep up the separation wall, but they told all the new people, the Gentiles, and the men in particular, that if you want to be a part of this new religion, not only do you have to get baptized like we all have, but you also must be circumcised. Anybody have a little shudder, guys? We're not talking about babies now, grown men. Put that on the ad of the newspaper. <laughs> Come join us, guys, and get circumcised. Good idea. Now, that's the early church. It broke Paul's heart to see this us versus them attitude. And so he reminded them who they were and to whom they belonged. He said, you're all a part of the body of Christ, and it makes no difference. It could be an arm or a leg, an eye or an ear. It doesn't make any difference who you are, when you came, how long you've been here, what your background might be. You're all a part of the body and not just anybody, but the body of Christ. And it is his love then that is meant to bring us all together because that's the mission of the church and not to tear us apart. Martin Luther understood this. After all, he got it from Jesus. And he gave a little analogy, a little parable. Imagine a mountain pass. On one side, there is a sheer wall. And on the other side, there's a steep cliff. And two goats, they come together. There's not enough room for the two of them. They come together. There's not enough room for them to turn around and go back the other way. There's not enough room even to back up. What do you suppose is going to be the solution? 
you would imagine that they would butt heads until one of them fell over the precipice to their demise. But Luther says that's what humans will do. (laughs) But the goats, one of them literally would lay down so that the other could walk over him. Somebody tell me, what does the acronym G-O-A-T stand for? What is GOAT in the sports world today? Anybody shout it out? What is it? Greatest of all time, time, right? Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, take your pick who it's going to be. Can we change that? From greatest of all time to gentlest of all time. Can you imagine what the world would be like, what the church, would be like if we would let others walk all over us. The world says not at all. We have the exact opposite attitude. We need our own way. We are the ones who are the most important. But Paul says and Luther says, learning from Jesus, they will know that we are disciples by how we love one another. And so this morning I want to talk a little bit about what that looks like now in the church. How love can make all of us here in the body of Christ feel safe. And how we can welcome those who are not yet a part of us. You see, unfortunately, there are many in the church today and throughout the generations who suffer from a particular religious disease. Let's call it egotitis. You know what an itis is, right? An itis is an inflammation, a swelling of a part of the body. When one part of the body is reacting against another. So if you have bronchitis, what do you have? A swelling of the the bronchial tubes, right, here in the throat. If you have appendicitis, you have a swelling of what? The appendix. If you have dermatitis, it's a swelling of the skin. If you have arthritis, it's a swelling of the arth. (laughs) What is that? Joints, right? Bursitis, arthritis goes together. Well, in the church, there is this egotitis, a swelling of the ego, which says, I am more important than you. This is how it looks. If I'm sitting in the front row, I'm more important than you in the back row. Although in the Lutheran church, if you're sitting in the back row, it means you're the most important. Sometimes we get the idea that if I'm wearing a certain collar, I'm more important than you. If I'm a leader in the church, I'm more important than another. If I've been here longer, I'm more important than another. If I'm older or if I'm younger, (laughs) I'm more important than another. And yet Jesus says that we are all part of the body of Christ. When I was growing up, Blackburn, Missouri, later on in Concordia, many small towns, many Lutheran churches, and there was a divide among the denominations. You could go down a particular street in many small towns in the Midwest, When there were only two churches, all Christians mostly, very few who did not believe, who did not go to church, and yet when you saw someone in the street, if I was a Lutheran and you were a Catholic, you would cross the other side. Can you imagine people of God and yet crossing to the other side? When I was in the South, in my vicarage church, first in Arkansas, later on when I was serving in Atlanta, Georgia, there was this group called Baptists. Have you ever heard of them? Baptists. Yeah, they're called that because of the way that they baptize people. Now, we could, we could talk theology. We could debate why it is as Lutherans we baptize infants for a very good reason, because they are sinners. We want no one outside the rule of God in his kingdom. We know that baptism is a sacrament, that in this water, the word of God is present. And a heart is changed. There is new life and salvation. And the promise of a relationship with God forever. We want that for everyone, including babies. But we're talking about the amount of water 
How many of you have seen a baptism here at Emmanuel from this font? Raise your hand. Have you seen it? Do we drown the baby? We do not. I would have very few parents who would agree to drowning their baby. It's kind of like the circumcision for adult males. It's not a pleasant thing. But the Baptists in the South, they said, we got to immerse the body. Because of that great passage where Paul says that when we are baptized into Christ, we are buried with him. And think of the analogy. When you bury a body, how much do you put under the dirt? All of it. And not just a little bit, but six feet under, correct? So the Baptists say you got to bury that body in the water, immerse them, every part of them. And yet, being a Lutheran and a German on top of that, there is a stubborn streak that goes among us. And we say, no, we're going to use the smallest amount of water possible. <laughs> and so we just do a little sprinkling, a little dabbing, sometimes just the thumb in the water and make the mark on the forehead. That's all the water you need. To prove the point, it's not the water that does these great things, but the Word of God. That's what changes the heart. And yet in the South, we as Lutherans were viewed as a cult because we didn't use enough water. And it's not just in denominations, but in our churches as well. A sad story. My very first church, we had a division. Can you imagine over something as trivial as where you place the flowers on the altar? Now, to prove that I was right, <laughs> <laughs> where do the flowers go? in back of the altar. So this is in the proper place. Understand, we had a church building that was a former Baptist church converted into Lutheran. And so you have to have a big baptistry back here full of water. But we're Lutheran, so we aren't going to do that. So we board the thing up, cover it over. Takes away a lot of space. There's no room to put the flowers in back of the altar. So where does the altar guild put them? On the altar. Gas, oh God, help us. <laughs> Can you imagine where we place the flowers or the candles? Whether we wear an alb or a robe or have a collar or wear a suit, whether we use an organ or drums and a guitar. Can we sing, they'll know we are Christians by our love with an organ? I think you can. With drums and a guitar, I think you can. Around a campfire or in a building. Paul writes this, you are all sons of God, children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus for all of you, and not just you, but all Christians everywhere of every generation, of every denomination, of every stripe that there might be. You were baptized into Christ, and so you have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither... Lutheran nor Catholic, Baptist nor Methodist, male nor female. There is no wall dividing the church between the Gentiles and the Jews, the men and the women, the children and the adults, the old and the new, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And yet we have this paradox. We are all one. We have this liberty. We have this freedom to worship God in many different ways. 
to show his love in all kinds of actions. And yet, Luther says this, a Christian is a free lord over all things and subject to no one. And yet a Christian is also a subservient slave of all things and subject to everyone. Somebody want to explain that? How can you be a slave to everything on the one hand and a slave to nothing and no one on the other? How can we have freedom in this country and yet still have responsibility. There must be a monitor. There must be something that is in control other than our selfishness and our ego. And Luther says, as Paul says, as Jesus says, that is love. When love is our governor, then we can be free in all things and yet respect the opinion of others. How did we put it to the little ones? Love your neighbor this morning, right? The good Samaritan, the Samaritan, the Jews did not get along, and yet the Samaritan took the Jew as his own and cared for him until he was healed. What about this? Anybody, anybody know the golden rule? How does it go? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so when we differ and we will, when we differ in opinion, be the goat, the gentlest of all time. Literally, let another Christian walk all over you. Hear their opinion. Respect what they have to say and then walk together in love. Can you imagine what the world would be like if they saw all the churches and all the believers and all the followers of Jesus walking together in unity? We can learn a lot from the little ones and how they treat each other. And not just little ones in stature or in age, but the little ones who are new to the faith, like the Gentiles there in Galatia. Or today, there is a particular tribe on one of the Pacific Islands, and there was a missionary there. Bishop Fulton Sheen talks about how they respond in faith. Someone asked the missionary there, what is the greatest virtue of these people, these new believers, these new Christians. And he says, well, I'd really like to describe it in the opposite way. I'd like to describe to you their greatest vice. Well, what's that? He says it's something called kaipo, translated meaning do not eat alone. You see, this is what they do. These people, new believers, new to the faith, having been pagans for generations, actually centuries. They will not eat alone. Meaning that sometimes they could go days without a meal until they could find someone to share their food with. Imagine, that's their greatest vice, <laughs> eating alone. What would our church be like if you would share your blessings with your neighbor, with those next to you? Share your food, share your talents, share your gifts, even with those who disagree with you. And what if the world were to see this? This radical love the sacrifice that begins at the cross. In fact, as we look at the cross as instrument of torture and shame, but also self-sacrifice and love, we can't have any walls among us, can we? 
when our focus is always on Jesus and what he has done, the walls come tumbling down. They can do nothing else. And the whole world will see that we are Christians by our love. And there won't be enough walls or enough seats to hold all the people. I'll close with this. Mother Teresa has a quote. It's there in your notes in the Think, Talk, Pray section. And I hope that you will take these home and discuss what you've heard today. She said, in the name of Jesus, make room for these children of God. She was talking about people that were opposed to a city council. A city council that was not going to allow a halfway house in their community because they didn't want those people in their midst. When Mother Teresa had heard about it, she came to the meeting and she said this, in the name of Jesus, make room for these children of God. When you reject them, she said, you reject Jesus. And when you affirm them, you embrace Jesus. Imagine what the church would be like if every person that we met not only was our neighbor, but was viewed as a child of God. When we affirm them, we embrace Jesus. And the whole world would look at us and they would believe in our God because there is no other way that people who have different opinions can ever love each other unless God is at the heart of it. Let's all rise and make our